talk loud because I gotta talk this. <laughs> but anyway, okay, so today's uh, yeah, the last lecture, welcome. Um, we're gonna talk about a little introduction of informal geometry. Um, small introduction because the topic is actually quite large and there's lots of papers on it, lots of research groups doing this stuff. Uh, and the reason is the mathematics is somehow easy to really get your hands on, but it's still nevertheless very deep. And the reason for that is because it's like it's like complex analysis except on surfaces. Like I don't know if you have, did you have to take a complex analysis course? Yeah. It's like it's you know like the Cauchy Riemann equations is like it's like oh that, that that's it. But some, somehow once you learn the Cauchy Riemann equations, there's this enormous body of <laughs> knowledge which follows from them. So um, it turns out that a similar phenomenon is true at a nonlinear, you know, curved setting. You can, you can transform a surface into a complex manifold. And then it's a lot of us, well, many of them, parallels of complex analysis, many of the ideas of complex analysis still hold. Okay, so in particular, um, we'll talk about conformal maps, and then this connection of complex manifolds, and then um, a little bit about how conformal parameterizations, so what is important about conformal parameterization. And then we get to the, the, the big theorem in conformal geometry, which is this uniformization theorem. And then uh, I'm going to hand over at that point. Um, I'm going to hand over to Justin at that point. I'm going to appear and join the lecture today. Okay, so what's a conformal map? Well, so as we saw, um, you can rarely make two shapes isometric to each other because they just aren't. Like, it's almost just very rigid, very rigid notion. Two shapes to be isometric is a very strict, strict condition. Um, so you want to know if there's a weaker uh, a weaker condition that is more common than isometric than isometric components. And so this brings us to conformal maps. And let's say the starting point for conformal maps, for a conformal map between two surfaces, is that it preserves angles but not lengths. So um, maybe you can see it best in the two pictures here. Uh, in, in what we're looking at here is a conformal map from a, from, a, from a plane to a surface. And the idea is that at least in this, this side of the story, here, um, you see uh, the checkerboards get mapped over to slightly on the checkerboards, let's say. But the key is that the right angles are preserved. Wherever there's a, wherever there's a right angle in the top, you get a right angle down at the bottom. So if you think of all the intersections of the, of the checkerboards, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the squares. Um, and the checkerboards themselves can rotate and be different sizes. This is because um, lengths are not preserved. So you can have checkerboards, the top end, Let's say you map very large squares here, but at the bottom end you have very small squares. What's key is, and also the squares rotate as you go, but what's key is that the right angle at every corner is always preserved. You can see a similar phenomenon over here. Um, here I'm mapping a, a field of circles onto the, onto the body by the same conformal map, and you see the circles are of different sizes, but um, they always remain circular. If angles were to change, under a map, a circle might get mapped to some kind of sheer thing like an ellipse. But in this case, circles are always be mapped to circles. Um, and uh, and uh, different size, but still circles to circles. Okay, so a conformal mapping is one where you, where, so an isometry would, would, would preserve lengths and angles. And what you do is you weaken one of the conditions. You say, uh, preserve, you say, you drop the angle, you drop the length preservation. Just preserves lengths. Sorry, doesn't no longer needs to preserve lengths. Just preserves angles. Okay, so uh, right, so that's the uh, that's the local definition. Now, as far as my is concerned, um, what we want is a, to study a mapping from surface to a surface. And the fact that it's conformal, the fact that it preserves angles, means that um, that the inner product of mapped vector, so d phi of x. Um, d phi x uh, y. So uh, let's say we have our surface over here, we have a point x, and then we have a vector capital X and a vector capital Y. So maybe this should be, this should be g on the other side. Right, so um, here's surface 2, here's surface 1, find maps over. So what can happen is the Maybe the, um, the lengths of these vectors can change, but, no more colors. Some colors over there? No, no, someone stole the color markers? Okay, no color markers. All right, anyway, so this angle stays the same. So theta is here, um, same angle theta there. Okay, how does that manifest itself mathematically? Well, what I want is 
this inner product, which of course is equal to, you know, it's equal to an angle uh, theta multiplied by the length of um, d phi of capital X multiplied by the length of d phi of capital Y, right? I want this to be pres I want I want the lengths to be preserved. I'm sorry. I want the angles to be preserved. So basically, what I what I, you know, what I can do is I can divide by the lengths, and what I should have is um, an angle uh, which is unchanged. Okay. Fundamentally, what that means is that my metric tensor has to change by the multiplication by a function. I just need to. Uh, I want my metric to. I'm allowing my metric to scale, but I, I don't want the the value x comma y to sort of the Normalized values from a wide change. Is that angle? Okay, so definition of a conformal map then is that there exists a function, a map is conformal if there exists a function such that the metric tensor on the pushed forward vectors is equal to a function times the metric tensor on the old vectors. And the, this convention, even the 2U, is just a convention. Um, you, could put, you could put F here, function F, and then the, con then the condition would be F is positive. You just want a positive function. So e to the 2u is a nice form for a positive function. And it turns out that it makes certain derivatives, uh, you know, when you compute Christoffel symbols or something, and it makes them look a bit nicer. So the convention is e to the 2u. OK, does that make sense? OK. So, um, OK, so the idea is that conformality is a very, very flexible condition. So uh, it turns out you can always find a conformal map. You can always make a manifold conformally, or surface conformally flat. So let me explain that in a picture. Okay, so the idea is, no matter how complicated the surface, right, here's your surface, right, um, the idea is that in the, the neighborhood of any point, so let's call this P on the surface, the neighborhood of any point has a set of conformal, a uh, set of isothermal coordinates. Um, what that means is there exists a uh, conformal map from a subset of the plane. Um, and the metric on the plane is just the Euclidean metric. Right? Um, and then up here is the induced metric. Which is, which is, you know, it depends on the intrinsic geometry of the surface. So it's definitely not a trivial, not a flat, unequally metric. But there exists a um, conformal transformation such that when you pull back, so this is the pullback, right? When you pull back the induced metric, you get the Euclidean metric. Well, not quite the Euclidean metric. You get something which is conformal to Euclidean metric. So this is called um, this is called conformal conformally flat, and it's conformally flat because you're a subset of Euclidean space, and the the background metric is Euclidean. So the background metric is flat. This metric, if you were to compute the Riemann curvature tensor of this metric, it wouldn't be zero. It's obviously going to be the same Riemann curvature tensor metric of S. But the Riemann curvature tensor metric of the background is zero, and it's conformally flat. Okay, so uh, right, what I'm saying here is that there exists these, there exists this map phi, and the pullback metric, which is of this form, is identity one one, so it's the Euclidean metric times e to the two u. Okay, so that's the form. Okay, how do you prove this? Well, what you what you do is you write down so to prove by solving PDEs, at least by quoting an existence theorem for partial differential equations. So what you do is you uh, make phi the unknown quantities, phi is the unknowns, and uh, you write down the conditions that the metric be diagonal uh, up to a uh, up to a uh, yeah up to di diagonal but not the identity. You write down those conditions, and it turns out those conditions lead you to a fully determined PDE that you can solve. Well, up, up to some, up to some natural ambiguities like you know rotations over here and uh, rotations down here. Remember, we, remember um, this, this this sort of approach came up before when we tried to prove that 
a manifold might be. Can you find uh, an embedding phi from the Euclidean plane into the manifold? That was the so-called map maker's problem. You wanted to find a flat map that you can map directly without changing lengths onto the surface. And that was impossible because you tried to write down the PDE and you came to these integrability conditions, which was the Riemann curvature tensor. Well, it turns out if you just ask the metric to be diagonal and not the identity, if you just ask it to be right diagonal, those integrability conditions are automatically satisfied. They go away. They aren't, they're not there. Um, and so that makes this, this equation uh, determined. Okay. So you can, you can find these isothermal parameters, the isoth isothermal coordinates. I'm not sure where the name isothermal came from. I think they have something to do with, um, uh, I think uh, uh, Boltz might have used these ideas in, in when he was working out um, thermodynamics. So I think this came up there. But anyway, I'm not quite sure where the name came from. Uh, but anyway, they call isothermal parameters. Okay, so corollary is that every surface is locally conformally planar, which means you can take a uh, small region and it's conformal to the plane. And also, it means another thing, which is that any pair of surfaces, no matter what, are conformally, um, so this is S1, are conformally equivalent. Here's locally, of course. Here's a P prime, and then here's a phi prime, which goes over here into this R2. So U prime and R2, right? And um, this mapping, just we can just take the identity, at least restrict it to the common overlap. You know, you move these move these things around right, the correct way so they overlap properly. And the um, basically the, the map which goes the map which goes be a different color. The map which goes like this. So this would be um, this would be uh, phi prime propose sorry this would be phi inverse proposed phi prime. That mapping, that mapping is, is conformal. The reason it's conformal is because, is because the, these factors are going to multiply together. Right? You're going to have from, you're going to have, let's say, phi prime proposed phi inverse upper star of g down here is going to give you, you know, phi prime upper star um, e to the 2ug, which is going to give you e to the 2u phi prime upper star g, which is going to give you e to the 2u e to the 2v times um, the next you know, times the next g, right? So this is sort of a sketch. This is not quite rigorous, but the point is that um, when you two, when you follow two mappings along like this, the, the product uh, the conformal factors just multiply. And the end result is another metric, which is conformal to where you started. Right? So any two surfaces are now conformally equivalent. So this is an extremely flexible, or at least it seems on the surface, extremely flexible um, notion of conformal equivalence. Right? Make sense? I got kind of lost in that next part. Uh, because it seems like a very, very strong statement that two surfaces, any two surfaces are conformal. Oh, that's, that is too strong a statement. But um, note the key word which saves the day, which is locally. So I can, I can only find these isothermal parameters in a neighborhood of the surface. And then I can only compose them through in a neighborhood. I can only compose through, um, uh, yeah, I, 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 I can only compose from this neighborhood to that neighborhood. So I can find a conformal mapping from here to here. Not necessarily one that I could extend all the way around the metaphor. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so there's, so as I said at the beginning of the lecture, there's a there's a very deep connection in complex analysis. So I won't we won't go into it because um, well, it's a whole new language. Well, we have to import the language of complex analysis, holomorphic functions, and all of that. We have to import the whole language of complex analysis into um, into Riemannian ge geometry, surface geometry, and that's that just takes too much time. So I'll leave it here. Let's just say that the connection is extremely deep, gives you lots and lots of very cool results. Um, but anyway, the way it starts is you replace R two with C, which is kind of well, which is sort of tautology. You can do this. It's, it's, what you can always do something like this, but it, but at the end of the day, you need. You need things to be consistent with uh, with each other, with complex analysis. 
In any case, how does that work? So, okay, once you replace R2 with C, now what you want to say is that every uh, neighborhood is holomorphic to a neighborhood of C. And like the, the connection of complex analysis comes because um, because multiplication by square root of minus one, by I, multiplication by the better number, in the complex plane is equivalent to rotation by pi over two in the real numbers, right? If you multiply uh, a vector by I, you rotate the vector, right? Um, and um, I don't know, that, that's, and that, that condition of, that condition, this, this equivalence here, that multiplication by I is equivalent to rotation by pi over two, and the fact that on a surface, you can always, on an oriented surface, you can always rotate to length by pi over 2. You can identify the rotation of pi over 2 with the multiplication by i. And so you make this, uh, that's the basis for, for saying that all these operations in complex analysis are equivalent to operations in, um, on the surface in, as, as a real two-dimensional manifold. Okay, so then, so then you have this thing called a complex manifold and you can define holomorphic functions on a complex manifold and biholomorphic maps. You can do it and you have Taylor series expansions and, uh, and so on and so forth. So we won't go more there, but just to say that once you start reading some conformal geometry papers, often you will immediately sort of port over into the world of complex analysis. Okay, so um, the next question is what happens uh, globally? So there's this thing called the uniformization theorem. which gives you um, an idea of global conformal equivalence. Yeah, the uniformization theorem is an extremely, like it's a perfect mathematical result. It says that any surface, um, that any, the geometry of any surface whatsoever can be understood in terms of a very small number of model geometries, or model spaces with model geometries on them. Uh, this uniformization theorem is a complete mathematical statement. So it says any compact abstract manifold, so it doesn't even have to be an embedded manifold, it can be just an abstract two-dimensional object. Suppose it has a metric G. Then the theorem says that S possesses a metric G bar, which is conformal to G, but G bar has constant Gauss curvature. And, well, there's three possibilities, because you can scale. Scaling is a conformal transformation, so you can always you know, reduce to particular curvature once you've decided on one of these three values. So the three values are plus one, minus one, or zero. And if you know that number, then S is conformal to a model space, say we'll that in a second, which is one of the following. Um, in the, the sphere, the plane, or the unit disk. In the sphere, this, this occurs in the case of curvature one. And the sphere now carries its standard Euclidean, I mean, the metric induced on it by, by its embedding in Euclidean space. So the standard metric with the rotations is the isometry group and all that. In the case of curvature zero, um, you're, uh, you're conformal to the plane, I mean, globally conformal to the plane. This was just local conformal. Globally conformal to the plane uh, with a standard Euclidean metric. And that's, that occurs in the genus one case. I'll explain that also later. And finally, the unit disk is another possibility. This is when you have, this occurs when you have negative curvature, and it occurs, uh, it occurs in genus bigger than one. Um, and, um, and the metric on the unit disk is the so-called Poincaré metric. Have you guys heard of the Poincaré metric? Okay, so, uh, yeah, uh, some yeses and some noes. So let me just uh, describe a little bit what the Poincaré metric is. So here's the unit disk, right? Um, so this is uh, D sitting inside um, two, let's say, um, and the metric on it is one over one minus x squared minus y squared quantity squared um, dx squared, or sorry, multiplied by one zero zero one. Here's your here's your metric. Okay, so some properties of this thing. So complete, that's a key word, it's a new word we haven't used before. You've seen compact. 
compact means closed and bounded, um, and it's nearby you, you see the sphere, or you see sort of some wobbly uh, surface that kind of always drop. But a complete metric is different. This is kind of, well, this has, there's two ways to think about a complete metric. The first is, you should think about it as, you're allowed to go as infinitely as infinite. These man complete is a word reserved for manifolds which are unbounded. So you might have a, 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 a the graph of a function, but function defined on all of R2. This manifold goes off to infinity in all directions. And what complete really means is that if you start at any point and move along the geodesic in that, sorry, move along the geodesic in that point, the geodesic equation never hits singularity, and you can always keep going. All geodesics go off to infinity. That's what complete really means. And one way to think about that is um, you have a manifold in, uh, embedded in R2, which is infinite. In, in one other direction or other. Yeah. Yes. So G is the metric of some parameterization that is taking some square or rectangular graph to the disk. Yes. Am I, am I wrong? Uh, no, it's taking the whole surface to the disk. Oh, so, so it, it can be complete plane and infinite plane in R2, and it takes yes. this metric takes to the disk. Yes. Okay. Yes. We'll talk about how this, how this metric is infinite in just a few, just, just down this. So I said one way to think about complete is a manifold which is infinitely large. Another way to think about complete is a manifold which is small, like the unit disk, but the boundary isn't included. So this is in fact the, the interior of the open disk. This is in fact the open disk. There's no boundary there. And in fact, you want to think of the boundary as infinitely far away. And sure enough, this g has 1 minus x squared minus y squared. When x squared plus y squared goes to 1, in other words, you're out of the boundary, this metric blows up, which means the boundary is, in, is, in, which means the boundary is infinitely far away. So, so in fact, the geodesics, so here's a geodesic. Here's a geodesic in this metric. That's a geodesic. Um, I know this just because I know the geodesics of the point of a metric are. It's kind of a nice, happy coincidence that it's a straight line. Um, one of the geodesics is a straight line. But this is a geodesic which is infinitely long. It never reaches. So this length here, you know, all the way to the edge, is infinitely long. So the, you, want to, you have to think of the, the, the edge of the unit disk as infinitely far away. The, the geodesics in general are um, straight lines that make orthogonal contact with the boundary. These are geodesics in general. So it's a straight line in the boundary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this here is a geodesic. And, um, and, and, and in fact, and so is this one. Okay? So is this one. You can think of a straight line cutting across the circle as, as a generalized circular arc making orthogonal contact with the boundary. So this is a circular arc. Yeah, so the geodesics of the uh, Poincaré disk, the Poincaré metric, are circular arcs making orthogonal contact with the boundary. And you should think of them as being infinitely long. It takes an infinite amount of distance to go from here to here. Yeah, and it turns out that, um, that uh, yeah, that any surface can be mapped, any surface with curvature negative one can be, it's good formally equivalent to the unit disk with this point of metric. Um, and there's a small caveat in here, which is that uh, S is conformal to a model space, which is whose, um, let's put it this way, whose universal cover is one of these three objects. And the, the object itself is uh, the quotient by a finite group of self conformal maps of. Uh, one of these three model spaces. So in fact, there's a bit more there, um, which I don't really want to get into, actually. Um, well, okay, let me just say that, uh, that um, uh, yeah, let me just, maybe, uh, maybe I'll just, I'll just go there. Uh, yeah, question. Yeah, so, that's okay. Uh, the, what you say is that the plane is with its standard metric uh, is S, it has genus one. So torus is, similar to a plane. Yes. Uh, so basically, we can find some sort of conformal mapping G bar, yep. which which has a constant curvature, constant yep. curvature throughout. Yep. 
so that means we can cut the surface open because the torus is yeah. so the cutting the surface is allowed in this case. Well, okay, so maybe this is maybe maybe in this plane case is something that I can explain uh, this idea of quotient by a finite group of self-conformal maps. Okay, so um, you have some surface which has the topology of the torus. And this is S. And the idea is that um, is a okay, so we have to find a generator. This thing, we have to find two generators. These things are special loops. Uh, they're they're related. They're, they, they have, they have a, they're, they're they're sort of related to complex geodesics uh, or harmonic harmonic maps of, of curves. Okay, in any case, you have to find two places to cut the surface. And if you cut the surface, then you can take that cut region and map it into the plane. This is now R2. Uh, there's a, you, can, you can take that cut region and map it into the plane um, conformally. And you have the, zero, the conformal metric, uh, the background metric is really. Okay, so how is S conformal to the whole plane? Well, it isn't conformal to the whole plane. It's conformal to this little bit here. But the statement of the uniformization theorem is actually even stronger. What it says is that, in fact, S is conformal to the plane quotient by um, a group action. And this group action is, in this case, its translation by um, plus one zero and plus zero one, let's say. Or, in fact, zero L1 and zero L2, where, where um, L1 and L2 are uh, not exactly lengths, but let's say they're lengths of those, of those curves. So really, um, you want to think of um, S as having this universal cover, which means you have this big space um, where like, where like each one of these squares, each one of these translated squares, each individual one maps onto S. So you have a many to one, so what you have is a many to one conformal mapping from the plane back onto S, which is caused by sort of collapsing all of these squares onto themselves. Another way of saying that is, so, so that's a complicated way of saying the following thing, which is you have periodic boundary conditions on this square. The, you know, the, this point is the same as this point, and this point is the same as this point because they come from, you know, they come from, uh, they come from here, right? They come to these points. When you unwrap them, you get to, you know, this curve. This curve is this one, and this curve is this one, and so when you unwrap them, it's the same as the points are identified to each other, right? So. Yeah, so that's that's what's going on here. You have, that's that's how to explain this this little caveat here is that S is conformally equivalent to the plane, quotiented by this identification of edges, i.e. the periodic boundary conditions. A more complicated statement, well, it's the exact same statement is true for um, for the unit disk, except the uh, groups involved, the, the, the groups you quotient by. Aren't are they more complicated than the translation? In the translation, the uh, the self maps of the plane and the disk are so called uh, Möbius a certain type of Möbius transformations, and you have lots of interesting finite subgroups of Möbius transformations. So you want to so you push them by those, and you get these sort of interesting interesting shapes. Have you ever seen one of Have you ever seen uh, one of these? Um, uh, an image of a Riemann of a Riemann surface. Embedded in the Poincaré disk. Have you ever seen one of those? Like, they, they one, like this. There's one on a birthday cake, which is my favorite. They look like this. So what you do is you find a fundamental domain. So just like on the torus, you have a fundamental domain, which maps onto the entire surface. Right? It's the smallest. It's the smallest region in the in the, um, uh, the Planck-Avey disk, which maps onto the entire surface. 
And you've cut the surface along geodesics, so that means you're cutting the, the plane along geodesics as well, so it looks like this. And then you assemble the rest of the surface by reflecting across the boundaries. And if you reflect this five, one, two, three, yeah, five point thing across the boundary, you get something which looks like this. You get another one here, and then you get another one here, and another one here, and another one here. Right? So what you what you want to think of is that this this region right here is the reflection, reflection mapping of this, of the central region here gets reflected across this boundary and leads this smaller sort of squishier thing. That would be just that would be equivalent to taking this square and translating it over by one unit. Right? Except there, the translations are, are simple to understand. Here, the group is more complicated to understand, so that's where the shape looks different. Okay, then what do you do? How do you fill out? How do you fill out the entire Poincaré disk with this kind of idea? You keep reflecting every time you do the point, You keep reflecting, and so the picture looks like this central five-point thing with. Smaller guys on the outside, then in every disk, more smaller guys, then more smaller guys, and more smaller guys, and you go off to infinity, I mean, the edge, with lots of ever, ever smaller um, five pointed regions. Yeah, so you can, you can see pictures like this on the, online, they're really quite pretty. Okay, so I suggest, take a look, I should have put one of the slides actually. But I didn't think that. Okay, so that's the uniformization thing. Uh, any, any more questions? Okay. Um, yeah, so how do you tell what's what? Well, you, how do you tell what your, what, what is the correct target for the uniformization theorem? Well, the Gauss-Bonnet formula provides that connection, right? So, it starts here. It's a nice formula for, for the, uh, for the, for the Gauss corrections. If you, so here's the theorem, or here's the, quote, the lemma, let's say. If you have two metrics, G2 and G1, that are conformal to each other, with a conformal factor U, then you just go ahead and compute the Gauss curvature on the left with G2, and relate to the Gauss curvature of G1. And what you get is this nice formula. You get the Gauss curvature of G2 is the conformal factor multiplied by negative to the Laplace operator, so Laplace Petromio U, plus the Gauss curvature of the first surface. So, if, you know, so you can see if U is equal to 0, and then G2 equals G1, you get K2 equals to K1. And you know, if, if U is constant, you just get a scaling. But if U is non-constant, you have to make this correction factor uh, with the Laplacian view. Okay? All right, so let's integrate both sides of the equation. Let's, and, and also, let's assume that G2 is the uniform, uniformized metric. So G2 has constant curvature. So we don't know what that curvature is just yet, so let's integrate. So you integrate on the left, you get a constant multiplied by the area of the surface. That's what you integrate, right? And that's equal to K2 times DA2. And then let's replace K2 with the right hand side here. You get this formula. Um, okay, that's what you get. That's, 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 this is for K2. The area element, the dA, has to scale as well. Right? dA2 relates to dA1 by a scale. And that scaling is the opposite, it's e to the minus 2u. So these things cancel. And now you have an integral of two terms the Laplace operator and K1. Um, the Laplace operator, uh, by integration by parts, that disappears. And so you're left with k1 da1, or 2 pi times the Euler characteristic of the surface, topologically here. So this is why on the previous slide, the uniformization theorem had, um, had topology. It had this genus in it, right? Remember that the chi, sorry, over here. chi of s, the Euler characteristic, equals 2 minus 2 times the genus, right? OK, so it, it, the genus is the topological number of holes. Um, and that's 2 minus 2g is the other characteristic. OK, so what does that say? Well, it says the constant in the uniformization theorem is 2 pi chi divided by the area. So therefore, the sign that you're looking for is related to the sign of the other characteristic. So um, if the constant is plus 1, then the genus has to be positive. The only way you have a positive genus is if g is 0 and you have a sphere. Sorry, I have a positive other characteristic. You have g is 0. If you want the constant to be 0, the only way that happens is if 2 minus 2g is equal to 0, or in other words, g is equal to uh, 1, a torus, or something like a topology torus, and then the negative numbers 
come from higher genus surfaces. Okay? So the gospel name form is very important in this, in this game. Um, right, okay, so two more slides, let's say, and then I'll hand over to, uh, to Justin. Um, okay, so just a little bit of theory about genus one surfaces. I mean, genus, oops, that should have been, the title of this slide should be genus zero. <laughs> Genus zero surfaces. A genus zero surface is conformal to the sphere. Um, and uh, let's say a couple, two key facts. The first is the map, well, we can sort of discuss how the map is not unique. Well, okay, so how's that? So S2 is conformal to the complex plane by stereographic projection. If you work out stereographic projection, you will, if you do find the pullback metric of stereographic projection, you'll see that it's diagonal times conformal factor. Um, and, well, using complex analysis, we know that the conformal self-maps of the complex plane are the holomorphic self-maps of the complex plane, in other words, the Möbius transformations. So, um, whenever you map, right, so that means if phi times, yeah, that, sorry, that means um, that C has a whole bunch of, a whole group, large group of, of, uh, of, of conformal maps on the Möbius transformations. Okay, so what about non-uniqueness? Well, if you have two maps from S into S2, then I can, um, yeah, so what I do is then I, 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 follow, I follow the map forward from S2 into the complex plane, and now I can have, so now I know that my mapping following forward, they, you know, I get two different map, I get two different conformal maps of the plane. Um, which means they are related by a Möbius transformation. What is that? Um, pardon me. Um, sigma is the. Uh, I should have put sigma here. Stereographic sigma by stereographic projection. Uh, M is a Möbius transformation. No, 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 no. What, uh, what is the Möbius? What is a Möbius transformation? Uh, what? Uh, well, actually, we'll we'll see lots of pictures of that in the uh, second half too. So. Yeah, so, um, so uh, question, what are the, so what are the holomorphic bijective maps from the complex plane? Um, you know, Union infinity in our mind, but uh, yeah. So the, the answer to this question is one of the one of the something you learn in the complex analysis course as a consequence of the so-called Schwartz lemma. So in complex analysis, you learn the Schwartz lemma, and then you find the answer to this question are the Möbius transformation. The Möbius transformations are m of z is equal to a z plus b over c z plus d as viewed as complex numbers, and therefore I can, you know, I can divide complex numbers, right? The so-called fractional linear transformations. Um, Schwartz, the basic result in complex analysis is that the only holomorphic bijective maps from c to c are these Möbius transformations. And um, when you translate, when you translate into Riemannian geometry and you take C and you make C, you, you go away from complex analysis and you make C R2, holomorphic becomes conformal. The Cauchy Riemann equations for holomorphic map um, imply that uh, the metric transforms uh, conformal. Yeah. So we just bring this result into the world of conformal, conformal geometry. And what we know then is that the, uh, we have these various transformations here, which produce, which by pulling them back on our stereographic projection, give you self maps of the sphere, which are conformal. I think Justin's going to show some self maps of the sphere, some of these various transformations on the sphere. Okay, so because you have a whole, because you have a whole group of Mobius transformations on the sphere, all of which are conformal, you can have many maps, many conformal maps from S to S two. You, know, you take, you take, uh, you take one of them and you just compose it. Map, and you have another one. I mean, compose the Möbius transformation, and you have another one. That's the first fact: is that the uh, uniformization map is not unique. Like you have a whole, 
a whole non-compact, in fact, group of them. A second key fact that is true on for genus zero surfaces, and not true in higher, is that conformal maps to the sphere are minima of a so-called Dirichlet energy. So I think we may have mentioned Dirichlet energy before. The Dirichlet energy is the Frobenius norm of the derivative of the map, square, and integrated, L2 norm. Uh, this is a measure of stretching. It's the of, of uh, average, square, square average stretching of the map. And in terms of the minimum of this energy are conformal maps. Well, um, I guess if you want to make them by you know, bijective, impose a constraint the map does something. Yeah, and so as a result, of, as a result, one one way in which uh, in, in mathematics you prove the existence of um, uh, you can prove the existence of, of a conformal map in the first place is by uh, viewing this as the gradient on a space of functions on a space of maps and flowing down the gradient until you find a minimum. And uh, because you have a non uniqueness non uniqueness minimum, minimum, you have to impose a special condition. You have to impose some condition to guarantee a unique. Uh, solution to this minimization problem. And so often what's done is you say that the uh, moment of the, um, the, the, the uh, center of mass of the map of the map is zero, it's at the origin of the sphere. So that's just an integral condition that's satisfied for the, for the, for the components of the map five. Um, this algorithm, uh, this prescription is, has been successful mathematically in a theoretical sense for proving the existence of conformal maps, and it's also been um, converted into a discrete algorithm. Which Justin may or may not uh, talk about, but it's a simple, discrete algorithm which has which has worked. Maybe it's not the state of the art nowadays in conformal mapping, but this is a simple algorithm which produces a conformal map for you. Um, okay. Higher genus surfaces. Well, so in higher, so in, in genus zero surfaces, there's one only one target in the uniformization theorem, which is the sphere. Um, the fact of the matter is, for genus higher than zero surfaces, the target surface in uniform free uniformization theorem and its metric can be different. There are different possible candidates for it. Um, this, this big long sentence, this for me is the conformal structure of S. It's sort of the, it's what remains invariant. What, it, what, it is what remains invariant in the conformal, conformal mappings of the surface. So the target surface in the, conf, in the um, uniformization theorem, let's say, is Let's say it's going to be either um, it's going to be either the, 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 some subset of the plane or some subset of the plane of A disk, which used to be here, and of course you have this group of transformations which allows you to spread it to the entire disk or the entire plane. So that's the target surface. The target surface is always um, that or this, but the metric there are different possibilities for the metric as well. It's not like the um, yeah, the induced metric, there are different candidates for the induced metric. Locally, they all look the same. They're, locally, they all look like either the Poincaré metric or the um, flat metric. Locally, they look like this. But globally, um, there are different possibilities. And so the interesting thing is, you can, a uh, mathematician that invented this thing called Teichmiller space, which is the space of conformal structures. So it turns out that, this, that the possible candidates for metrics are finite in dimensions, a finite dimensional space of metrics, which is really amazing. There are there's more than one possibility, but there aren't that many possibilities. So the dimension of Teichmiller space, which is the space of possible candidates in this uniformization here, for a genus one surface is two, and the dimension really, I think I pointed out already here, it's the it's the lengths of these curves. You you parameterize all possible conformal targets, um, target metrics of spaces by the lengths of these, of these special curves, these special generators. And for higher genus surfaces, it's 6G minus 6, where G is the genus. So for a genus 1, sorry, for a genus um, 2 surface, which is a double torus, you would get um, a 6 six-dimensional space. Okay, so a parameterization of this, uh, of this manifold, this abstract high-dimensional manifold of complex structures, of conformal structures, is provided by these holomorphic differentials. So I want you to think of the holomorphic di differentials as, um, as these special loops. But they're not that, they're just related to that. It's a complicated story. These things are related to harmonic one forms. So in fact, uh, in mathematics you can find, or I mean, you can 
find them in computational geometry using dis using discrete series calculus. And the natural coordinates of this type of space are expressed in terms of these harmonic one forms, these holomorphic differentials, I should say. They end up being line integrals of holomorphic differentials. That's why I say they're sort of like lengths around the curve, because you integrate one of these holomorphic differentials around a curve, and you get a number, and that number characterizes these lengths, a number characterizes which place, which conformal structure you're at. Okay, so that's a, that's a picture of, that's a sketch of a picture for hydrogen services. Okay, so I'm going to stop here, and uh, Justin's going to take over for his, uh, for his last part of the show. It's tough having an odd number of lectures in this class. So any questions on, uh, on this last bit? Okay.
said, yeah, no, no, I probably don't want to put a checkerboard on my elephant. Maybe these, these, these checkers represent pixels in, in an image, right? And I want to put an interesting skin texture on this guy. Uh, but rather than storing the texture of the elephant in a per-vertex way, um, which is very expensive, right? You need a lot, uh, usually the, 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 the amount of detail that's on the texture on the surface is much higher than the amount of detail in, in the geometry. And there's some, some interesting sort of perceptual reasons for that. Uh, but but uh, I need a way to have the, the geometry of the surface talk to the most reasonable way to store texture. And usually that's just on a piece of the plane, right? So usually what we'll do is we'll find some map from, from the, the at least patches on, on your 3D shape uh, to patches on the image plane, and then we'll store the texture for the shape on the image plane. Right? It's a very typical pipeline in computer graphics, and both at the low and high level. Although not always, right? In fact, there's some recent papers that say, well, what the heck, let's put the texture right on the mesh. And, and that makes a lot of our mathematics easier, but, but the, the trade-off is that you have to store a lot more data. Anyway. Um, so, so there are lots of approaches, and, and I've chosen two to talk about today. Um, one of them happens to be from one of our collaborators, so we know it a little bit better than, 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 than some. But, but it's actually a pretty typical approach to the type of uh, informal geometry that you see uh, in this discrete sort of arena. Uh, that's this paper here on conformal flattening. Um, and the idea here is that we're going to try and construct conformal parameterizations of the surface with sort of minimal input from the, uh, from the user as we, as we do that. So, uh, you know, that's, as, as, as the, the story by now is probably a little bit, a little bit uh, you know, repetitive to you guys that we've seen in 468 from about week 8 onward, right? Which is, how do we go from the continuous theory that Adrian talks about to, you know, the, uh, the discrete one that we're going to need to be able to implement on triangle meshes and so on. And, 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 and the, the, we, we tend to use the same hammers and, and, and techniques, which is great because you guys now have the tools to be able to do that. So for, for this sort of discretized version of uh, conformal mapping, in this case, we're going to need a couple of things. Right? Now, now remember that the, the metric of a surface is ways to measure angles and distances and so on. And for these folks, enough of an idea of a metric is simply the pile of edge lengths where you just assign one positive number to each edge of the mesh topology that you have uh, for a given surface. Right? Now, remember the metric is both uh, distances and angles, but this is actually enough to get, uh, for example, the interior angles of the triangles. Right? If you know the three lengths of three sides of the triangle, you know three angles. And so this really is some discrete measure, or some discrete understanding of the metric of a surface. And then, uh, just like we talked about, gosh, however many weeks ago, um, remember that, that, that Gaussian curvature comes into play when we talk about intrinsic structure for a surface. And in this case, we can use just the simplest possible one. Uh, remember there's this angle deficit uh, idea of Gaussian curvature. In fact, I think you implemented it on your homework, right? Where you, oh gosh, there's a lot of them. Um, we're good with uh, one of these transformations. It's very important. Uh, by the way, I apologize, Adrian's French and German pronunciations are far better than mine. Um, fortunately, my high school Spanish is completely worthless in the differential geometry. Um, anyway, so, so we have, uh, we have you know, this, this surface, which is comprised of triangles, and if we want to measure Gaussian curvature at a vertex, remember one of the sort of simple things we can do uh, is, is take the sum of the interior angles of all the vertices adjacent to that vertex and simply subtract it from 2 pi, right? Uh, and, and I think we've gone in quite some detail like, explaining why this is a reasonable measure of Gaussian curvature, at least integrated in this little patch here. Uh, so what we can do is we can think of Gaussian curvature as an assignment of one number uh, to each vertex of the surface. And then one way to think about parameterization uh, is what is the Gaussian curvature of the, of the parameter plane? What's the, what's the curvature of a plane? What do we think? Zero. Yeah, it's flat, right? And so uh, one of the things we, we, one way to think about parameterization is we want to take this thing with positive and negative numbers that are non-zero every which way and, and, and make them zero, right? And, and once we've done that, now we know that this now looks like a piece of the plane and we can go back and reconstruct. In fact, it's pretty easy. Uh, uh, so, so what? Uh, sorry. So, so what we can say is, let's say now that I'm just going to think of curvature as this abstract function for vertex, 
any function that adds up to 2 pi times the Euler characteristic of my surface, remember we proved that for, for a Gaussian curvature, is enough to be able to reconstruct some piece of geometry uh, from that set of curvature numbers. And uh, the reconstruction process is actually not so bad. Right? Uh, right, so, so you can, uh, well, yeah, so we'll come back to exactly how to reconstruct in a moment. So our new goal, uh, like I said, is to take the Gaussian curvature which is distributed in a nice smooth way on your surface, and remember it's got to sum up to 2 pi times chi, right? That, that, remember we proved this is a, a topological invariant? But if we can concentrate it in a couple singularities, what we can do is sort of cut little curves from one singular to the next. I should have drawn a picture. And then um, these things now become little patches that we can parameterize the plane. Let me go so, back to the original slide. Oh, the time slide yeah, the actually, time. that's true. Um, yeah, so what we're going to do is we're going to choose a, a couple of singularity points on our surface here. And we're going to say that all of our Gaussian curvature, we're going to move to these points, and everywhere else we're going to have the surface be flat. Right? And then what we know is if we then take our simple equation, uh, if we take our surface and just connect, you know, connect the dots here, and then generate lots of little uh, pieces with this topology, if we then take our scissors and cut that little piece out of the surface, we know the, 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 since we've assigned zero curvature to the remaining parts, we can parameterize that into a plane. This is the cute trick. So how are we going to do that? Well, remember we had this formula that, that, that Adrian just mentioned uh, for, for how to understand the uh, informal factor for a surface. Remember the informal factor is this way uh, to say locally how much your, your metric is stretching from the source of the target surface. Right? And, and we have this nice relationship, which is uh, uh, the, the, the sort of Poisson-looking equation that tells you the uh, Laplacian of this conformal factor. It's related to the sort of difference between the starting and ending uh, Gaussian curvatures. So it turns out discreetly, something kind of magic happens, which is that this really irritating nonlinear factor in U just disappears. This is actually a very surprising fact. And, and the sort of high-level justification for this is, is, is completely reasonable, and then when you start reading the actual proof, it becomes far less reasonable, um, but, but correct. And the idea is that, remember that our notion of Gaussian curvature is an angle deficit? What happens if I scale my surface up? Does anything happen to that, num to that number? No, right? Because it's just an angular thing, and these are all similar triangles. Right? And somehow, scaling my surface up and down um, is equivalent to, you know, it's changing this conformal factor, right, just by, by some number. And it turns out that the correct scaling factor actually is this exponential here. So if we use our, dis our discrete uh, Gaussian curvature as angle deficit not divided by the area of the one ring or what have you, this is exactly the right thing to do to get rid of this factor here. This is very surprising. And um, you can prove this in a very rigorous way. If you say that a surface has its Gaussian curvature, it turns out to be a sum of a bunch of little delta functions, uh, which is what a triangle mesh is. So this is exactly the right relationship to, to do. So we don't have time today to go through the proof of this, which is good, because I had trouble following it. But um, from a high level, that's sort of the reason why. So this is somehow exactly the right scaling factor, which is a little bit surprising. But anyway, what does this buy me? Well, now we have a way to go back and forth between uh, the curvatures of the source and targets, and the conformal factor of, of the conformal deformation that would go from one surface to the next, right? Namely, if I, if I want to, if somebody said and prescribes the initial vital curvatures, what do I do to, uh, to find u? Well, I just solve a Poisson equation, and it's invert this Laplacian operator here, and if there's one thing you've probably gotten out of CS468, it is that this operation is something we can do. Right? We know how to do Laplacians. In fact, we've done Laplacians to death in this class. So what is, how does this paper work? Well, what it's going to do is it's going to guess a new distribution of curvature, and then it's going to solve for the conformal factor, and if the conformal factor isn't too crazy, then we're going to say that, that, that our, our, the, the resulting prioritization is OK, and then we stop. And otherwise, we're going to add another point where we can concentrate curvature so that we don't have to induce a ton of uh, a, a ton of conformal stretching to, to the surface, right? And so the way that these folks, and, and this is where the engineering comes in, right? So there's the nice math. The story is concentrate curvature, parameterize, iterate, right? And we have to come up with a way to concentrate the curvature. So let's say that, by the way, the points where we're going to have non-zero curvature, we'll call cone points. And we're going we're to maintain a set of those called S. 
right? And so one, one kind of nice way to do this would be, uh, I don't know if we're familiar with Markov chains, this might be something computer, computer people have seen. Uh, but basically we can think of there being some little transition probability of curvature at a vertex to curvature at each of the neighboring vert the vertices, right? And there's this little time stepping process that goes on that says that at each unit time, my curvature is going to walk a little bit um, to each of its neighboring guys just in a nice diffusive way. By the way, nice diffusive way, once again, should think in the back of our heads, it sounds like a little flush in. And indeed, those, uh, those could be weights that we put in our transition matrix. But uh, what do we do? Well, we say, okay, we will make the set of cones sinks in this process. So if we have these probabilities of curvature transitions from one vertex to the next, um, the, the probability that, that, a vertex, that, 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 that it stays in S is 100%, right? So, so I'm, so I'm going to have this iterative process where I diffuse my curvature to all my neighbors, unless I am one of the cone vertices, in which case I'm just going to be greedy and keep it, right? And then I'm just going to iterate this process forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, which is the same as hammering this matrix over and over again. What ends up happening? Well, the sink vertices are going to get all the curvature because they're sucking it in and everybody else is diffusing it out, right? And so in the end, you get zeros and the non-interesting part and just a nice closed form formula uh, for, for how to figure out uh, where the curvature went. It's a very familiar story for those of you that, that study sort of eigenvalue problems and, and, and um, Markov processes, right? That, that it's very easy to reconstruct what happens in the long term. Uh, with these little iterative sort of, I give a little bit of my stuff to all my neighbors kind of processes. Yeah. What is S in K U? Ah, uh, oh. Oh, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I forgot to write it. The, the structure of this matrix looks something like uh, S T zero I. So all I did is, is, is broke up uh, this matrix here. So, so this is the part that, that, that has to do with the, uh, the, 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 the vertices that I've marked as, as cone points, and this is all the rest. What is D? Um, it's just some matrix of weights. So this is, uh, what I've done is I've given a block decomposition to this transition matrix, and these are the weights of uh, the probability that you will transition from the set of vertices that are not uh, cone points to the set of vertices that are, I suppose this is what that block is. And we are trying to find that, right? Yeah, so because what, what we have, again, is this process of, of just giving away a curvature, but there's only so many receiving states, so you know that eventually it's going to all end up in this. Yeah. So anyway, how do we, so, so, so there's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. In fact, the paper uses exactly that phrase, um, which is how do you mark what points are the cone points? Well, you've got to mark at least one, so initially you just choose some extremal curvature point. Because somehow you, you think of points as high curvature as places that are going to take a lot of work to relax uh, to a plane. Right? And then what do we do? Well, we run this little process for moving curvature into the singularities we've marked. And then I'm going to compute that conformal factor. Remember, that's just inverting the Laplacian operator. And we're going to look at it as a function on the surface. And if the conformal factor isn't too big, that says that my conformal math that, that, that this assignment of curvature has, has sort of induced is somehow not a very big amount of stretch, and we're good with that. And otherwise, if the conformal factor is every which way, then we're going to just add some singularities where the conformal factor is big or small and iterate. Right? This is a ridiculously simple algorithm to implement, and it, it, it turns out that it is very effective. In fact, it's just a couple of years ago, one, you know, the big award at, at the one of these computer graphics conferences because it's a very effective way to parameterize a surface with very little stretch. What's the nice thing here? What are the ingredients? Well, basically, the only ingredient you need, once again, is this Laplacian operator that we've constructed. So it's yet another example of an algorithm in CS4268 that, that once we have the, the, the sort of basic moving pieces, it's very simple to implement. Here's some, example, some more examples of singularities. You can see, I think the upper left example to me is the most interesting, right? That somehow, in the process of relaxing the curvature of the surface, you tend to choose these sort of sharp feature points, which, which, which makes sense, right? Because those are the ones with the highest uh, angle deficit. What are the black points? I'm sorry? It's black and red. Oh, uh, how does this go? Uh, I think what it is is, there, I think there, yeah, so, so the, the black ones look hyperbolic and the red ones look, um, the other one, the uh, <laughs> And uh, so, so there's a little bit, they have to distinguish between what kind of singularity they add. 
but it's not, it's not a big detail. Great, so, okay, yeah. Just so that I understand this guy. Uh -huh. uh, so let's say if we have a triangular mesh, uh, some stacked buttons, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, we can make uh, parts that is conformal to the rectangular patch, right? Yes. So that will be more than one parts, and they will be completely uh, in sync with each other. So I can actually put all those, I can actually build all those parametric maps that will exactly fit with each other. Yes. And yeah. it will fit to the standard. Right. right. So there's a little bit of a to topological issue, which is yeah. that the Stanford bunny is not a disk. Yeah. So okay. we do have to cut it somewhere, and, and that's where, so there's sort of some engineering decisions that happen there. Um, but what these guys do is just cut between these singularities. Um, but that's, you're, you're right, that it doesn't really matter which cut you chose, right? Thanks to the, the nice math we have, we know that, that uh, once we have the right topological object, we can map it to the plane, right? That's the, uh, the uniformization theorem, which is one that I've always struggled with. Same. Cool. All right, so uh, we have five minutes left, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on, on the remaining papers. There's a related a DDG, right? So, so that was a discretized thing, right? I didn't prove any theorems about the, uh, the flattening of the surface that comes out, but it's a very stable method. On the flip side, um, not to say that this isn't stable, but there, 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 there is a sort of discrete differential geometry approach that, that tries to go back and rather than just take continuous notions and discretize them, we want to define what it means to be discreetly conformally equivalent and then sort of push forward from that new definition to algorithms that process meshes directly, uh, which somehow is philosophically very appealing. Um, so in these guys, they actually have a very similar setup to the other paper. In fact, they came out at approximately the same time, and I think both papers cite each other as sort of like, guys, you should know this also exists. But anyway, they're going to assign one conformal factor per vertex, but now rather than thinking of this as a discret discretized conformal factor, we're going to say that the u sub i per vertex is the conformal factor for a discrete mesh. Notice the slight change of, of wording here. And then we're going to say that two meshes are conformally equivalent, if you can take the conformal factor on the two vertices adjacent to an edge and just average it, and then use that for your scaling of the metric. Right, so now our discrete metric is the same, it's still edge length. Um, and, and we've defined what it means to be edge-wise conformally equivalent. And it turns out we define this in a little bit of a strategic way, because what happens if you take the log of this relationship here? Well, you just get a linear expression in log of L, a log of these two guys, and the conformal factors, right? So if you fix your edge length, now finding the conformal factor is kind of a linear looking problem. Kind of nice. Um, and the, the kind of cool thing that happens is you can prove this little lemma. In fact, one direction is, is, is very simple to prove, <laughs> which is that two meshes are conformally equivalent with respect to this definition of conformally equivalent. If the edge length cross ratios are preserved, now, what does this mean? I should have drawn a picture. Uh, uh, so let's say that I have two triangles, um, which are going to be adjacent. So we're going to have I. I hope the orientation doesn't matter. I don't think it does. Um, OK. So the edge length ratio looks like LIM to LMJ. So that's uh, the ratio of this length this length, right? And then on the flip side, you'll have JK to KI. So, so it looks like the ratio of 1 to 2 is equal to the ratio of, well, this other 1 to this other, right? So in other words, if you have two adjacent triangles, right, a condition for, for these meshes to be conformally equivalent with this, with this new definition is simply that, that uh, for the two edges that are not adjacent to the center one, if you take the ratio of the remaining edge lengths, you get the same number. In fact, this is very easy to prove in one direction. Remember that we uh, sort of define conformal equivalence in terms of edge lengths, and so basically when you divide, that number is going to cancel. Yeah. The other direction is also pretty easy. Um, so anyway, now that we have all these definitions, we can basically go through the last paper I talked about, and, and follow it from beginning to end and have a very similar story, right? Placing singularities where there's high conformal factors and high curvature, uh, and then solving for this conformal map. Unfortunately, now, the, uh, the, the, this construction is nonlinear because this Poisson equation relationship 
is a discretized rather than discrete version of uh, informal factor, so they have to solve a nonlinear but convex system of equations, but the end result is, is very similar. Um, and the same applications, too. So anyway, I didn't, I didn't think it was necessary to chase this paper at the end, but it's worth knowing that, the, that you sort of have this trade-off, right? You can either have this very clean, discrete differential geometry set of definitions and then slightly more difficult optimization, or, or you, know, you can have an approximation thereof, which is, uh, which is faster to deal with, but um, the this, this story and maybe some of the theorems that you want to prove about it are, are harder to, to understand. Uh, one third idea for conformality that we won't have time to do in detail is just like Adrian mentioned, uh, informal maps preserve circles, right? In fact, there's this very slick animation, which my laptop doesn't want to play up there. Uh, you can see that as you take the formal maps of the plane and you draw a bunch of circles, these guys are scaling up and down, but they're not shearing in any, in any uh, interesting way. And so one very large body of literature in, in discrete conformal mapping uh, says that there's this area called circle packing, right? And the idea is to actually take advantage of this circular structure directly. And the way that you can do that is you can assign a radius to each vertex on your mesh, right? And then what, what you can do is look at if you have two adjacent vertices on your mesh, right? Once I've assigned a radius, I have two circles on these vertices. Right? And the circles will intersect at some angle. And what you can, by the way, you can go from that intersection angle back to the edge lengths of your mesh easily enough. Right? Because you've got sort of two radii and the angle they intersect, you've got triangle. Life's good. So it's a lot of cosines. In addition, you can think of conformality now, right? Because then what is conformality? You're preserving angles. And one way to preserve angles would be to preserve the intersections of these circles. It turns out that theoretically there are lots of nice things you can prove about this sort of circle packing case. Although once again you end up with very difficult nonlinear system equations you have to solve in, in the system in the uh, you, you know on the, on the implementation end. So unfortunately, I don't think we have time to talk about the second application that I wanted to discuss, but that's okay. Um, basically, conformal mapping is uh, has been applied recently to the problem of actually mapping between services. So I hand you two meshes, and I want to find which, uh, which points correspond. We talked about this a little bit two weeks ago. And sort of the idea of stuff looks just like this. One of the interesting observations you can make is that the set of conformal maps is a superset of the set of isometries. Remember that a goal of many of these mapping algorithms is to find an isometry between surfaces. Right? And one way to do that would be to search within the set of conformal maps for the map that looks the most isometric. Right? Because as we, we've learned today, conformal maps are somehow much easier to deal with. Right? And, 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 and this, this provides a whole class of algorithms. For example, this, uh, this, Mobius, uh, uh, this, this, this Mobius voting paper basically says, I'm going to take to the source and target surface and conformally map them in the plane. We know we can do that by the uniformization theorem. Right? And the conformal maps of the plane actually, at least, at least bijective conformal maps of the plane, have a very nice form. Right? They're these so-called Mobius transformations. By the way, I put a link to this video uh, on the slides, and it's worth watching, but maybe we'll kind of pan in the middle. Um, it has this little narration. But basically, the, 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 the Mobius transformations take this really slick form here that's very easy to write down. Right? Because of that, basically, you're just searching within sets of four numbers for the one that gets the, the, uh, oh, yeah. uh, the, 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 these two images of the plane to align with each other the best. Um, yeah, this, this video one looks a little worse. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, so once again, the, 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 the hard steps are simply mapping your services to the plane, and then mapping the plane to itself to align the services is easy, right? The nice thing is that the hard work happens once per surface, not once per map. Right? So you can somehow by computing, you can somehow by you know checking multiple maps or at least conformal maps, that is, or or even solving the mapping problem for different pairs of surfaces, uh, much more efficiently. Of course, the actual algorithm for for conformally mapping a surface to the plane uh, does require a bit of thinking. Um, it turns out that this is one of these cases where the discrete version is harder than the continuous one, and that it's. Uh, Oftentimes, it's possible to map a triangle mesh to a plane conformally in the sense that you just scale each of the triangles. Uh, so we have to redefine, once again, what it means to be conformal to the plane, and then so, uh, which is a little bit of a shame in such a thing. So anyway, I think we'll, we'll probably, we'll 
stop there with CS 468. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I think uh, both of us very much enjoyed choosing class. Um, you know, your homework is due to Diana when it's due, and you're welcome to ask us any questions and, and so on about the project. And uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, guys, thanks.